This morning's scripture comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. I'll just tell you right now, this is the most important chapter in 1 and 2 Samuel. It's one of the most important chapters of the whole Old Testament. So I encourage you to listen. <laughs> and if you don't, watch out. All right. Here we go. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, Why have you not built me a house this year? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from the from following the flock, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they have did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is God's word to us today. Well, as I said here at the beginning... This is a mountaintop chapter, not only for 1st and 2nd Samuel, but for the Old Testament. Because it moves along the story of God's salvation, God's redemption. Which began when God promised Adam and Eve, after they sinned and, uh, and separated themselves from, from the Lord, God said, one of your descendants will be the Savior. And that got narrowed down to not just any descendant, but one of Abraham's sons, as the, as the promise got passed to him. And now it's not just any of Abraham's sons, not just any of the twelve tribes, but from this one tribe of Judah specifically, from David's line. And this Savior will be a king. And eventually this will lead us to Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> this is a mountaintop chapter not only because it does that, but also because it shows us the heart of our Heavenly Father. Now I know my heart as a father. Oftentimes in my heart I say things like, Why? Won't she just keep her room clean? I mean, just keep it clean. And, oh my goodness, why can't they stop fighting? Why will they not stop fighting ever? And, why do they never sleep in on Saturdays, but sleep in any other day but Saturdays? They will not sleep in. And then I know my heart turns from those thoughts to if then then this deals. If you keep your room clean, I promise I will take you friends. If you let me sleep in, I, you don't even have to sleep in, just let me sleep in, I'll take you to Mecca's, I promise. And if you don't stop fighting, you will be grounded forever. <laughs> There's this quid pro quo, do this for me and I'll do this for you, aspect to my heart. And I'll tell you, if you ever try to wiggle out of it as dad, I mean, they'll call you on it every time, you know. If I, they do let me sleep in, and I don't take them back. Like, <gasps> you promised. You lied. I'm telling mom. <laughs> and then we usually end up going to Mexico, so I did, you know. Didn't that. Now, because this is the way most of our relationships exist, it's natural to think that this is how God relates to us. 
If we keep our noses clean, if we try to live a good life, if we go to church, which you guys are all here today, so yay for you, if we lend a hand to our neighbors, then God's going to be pleased. Then our Heavenly Father will bless us. But if we are consistently selfish jerks, or if we mess up big time, then God's going to hammer us. He's going to be ticked off. He's going to make us regret what we did. Quid pro quo, tit for tat, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back view of God. Now this is natural religion. We work for God, and God is obligated to bless us. This is how it works in all the other major world religions. Take, for example, in Buddhism. One performs and follows the Noble Eightfold Path, and by doing that, you receive enlightenment. In Hinduism, one perfects the four yogas, and you, when you do that, you escape the cycles of reincarnation. In Islam, of course, you adhere to the five pillars of Islam, and by doing that, you gain paradise. And even in Judaism, one keeps the law, and by keeping the law, you receive God's blessings. It's a, you do this for me, I'll do this for you arrangement. And that was certainly the mindset of the ancient Near Eastern kings in the time of David. <clears throat> a king was expected to build a great temple to their god so that their god would bless them and not curse them. And the more gods you had, the more temples you better build. So you could receive more blessings and avoid more curses. So that was the mindset of the nations in David's day. We better build our God a temple or else. But was that David's mindset? Let's read again what David said in verse 2 from our uh, passage today. He says, Here I am, living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Now this doesn't sound like David has in mind a quid pro quo, tit for tat, I better do this or else mindset at all. Instead, out of thankfulness for what God has done, David desired to build God the temple. Out of the awareness of the glory and greatness of God, <coughs> David wants to build God a temple. Now David's thinking is this, how can I, a mere flawed human being, how can I live in an opulent palace like this one? And yet the ark of God, where God makes his immediate presence most known to us, lives in a tent? No way, that's not right. So David's motivation appears to be pure and good. There's no sense in him that he has to do this or else he fears God's wrath. Nor is there any sense that God only wants to build a temple to get God in his back pocket, as it were. So that God's now obligated to bless him and his people. We don't see any of that in the text. David seems to want to build God a temple out of a sense of thankfulness, out of a sense of humility, out of a sense of, out of a sense of true worship. But the bigger question here is, how is God going to respond to this? And to help us appreciate how God does respond, I want us to think through how God could have responded to David, which might reflect how we respond sometimes, or how people respond to us. Now, God could have said to David, well, it's about time. I've been sitting here in a tent like an idiot waiting for one of you kings to figure out you better build me a temple. And considering how long I've been waiting, it better be a really good temple. Or, God could respond by saying to David, hmm, like I need your help, David. If I want a temple, I'd build a temple. I don't need you. You think I need your help to build a temple? I'll just build a temple, David. Huh? Or, God could respond by saying to David, okay, you want to build me a temple? That's fine, but don't you think I'm going to do anything for you? Uh -uh, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. I'm God. You're not. I don't have to do anything just because you build me a temple. And who says I want a temple anyway? Who says I want you to build a temple anyway? Now I give you these hypothetical responses because in our everyday living, these responses are all too common, aren't they? You try to do something good for somebody and your motives are questioned. They say, why do you want to do this for me? And they, sometimes you hear, what's the catch? What's the catch? And that means they don't think your motives are all, all pure. And in our quiet moments, we realize that sometimes we respond like that to others. We question their motives as well. It's because we live in a quid pro quo, tit for tat, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of world. But that's our world. That's not God's world. 
So God's response is very different. It's unexpected. It's not like us at all. Listen to God's actual response in verse 5. He says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent is my dwelling. Whenever I moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I command to shepherd my people Israel, did I say, why have you not built me a house of cedar? David, I have never commanded or even asked for a house from Moses, from Joshua, from any of the judges, not even Saul, the first king, nor have I asked you. And yet you desire to do this for me without my asking. Now, parents, of course, we appreciate, we know how much we appreciate when our kids do something for us without asking. It, like, triples the value of what they did for us. And we are so appreciative, and we feel the sense of accomplishment. Like, okay, I'm not a horrible mom or a horrible dad. And something must be right. They did. I can't believe they did this. This is wonderful. Well, that's how God feels about David at this moment. He's proud and appreciative that David wanted to do this for him without ending any prompting. And so God continues to speak to David in verse 8 by saying, Listen, David, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies before you. See, God reminds David that he, God, is the one who has brought David to this point. Without him, David would not be king. He'd probably still be a shepherd following his flock in the field. But because God has been with him, David is king, and his enemies have been cut off. That's what God has done for David in the past. Those are the reasons why David ought to build God the temple, but God's not done here. Listen to what he says next to David. He says, Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come for your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God's like, David, do you want to build me a house? No, 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 I'm going to build you a house. David, do you want to make my name great? Guess what? I'm going to make your name great. You want to plant... Uh, me, have a place to be for me to be secure? Well, guess what? I'm going to plant you and your people, Israel, to the, in, uh, into this land and make you very secure. David, you want a place for me to dwell into the future? How about this? I'm going to establish your house, your kingdom, your throne forever. God's response here gives us a glimpse into the heart of our Heavenly Father. We think sometimes that God is up in heaven just waiting for us to do things for him. And getting all upset because we haven't figured out yet, because we're not doing it, we haven't figured out what we should be doing. Instead, what do we find in this passage? God can't wait to bless and give and shower his love and grace on David, on us. David, you think you're blessing me? No, it doesn't work that way. I'm going to bless you. You can't out-bless me. You can't out-give me, David. Sometimes we get so focused on what we should do for God that we forget the most important thing is what God has done and is doing for us. When God first responded to David, he reminded him that he, God, was the one who picked David. He, God, is the one who made David king. He, God, is the one who gave him rest from his enemies. What did David do to deserve that? Nothing. David didn't do anything to earn that. And yet, God still blessed him. And now that David is thinking about building a God a temple, God's reminding David, listen, that's wonderful, you want to build me a temple, but you got to remember I'm the one who blesses you. I'm the one who gives. Everything David and Israel has is from the Lord's hand. Given, not earned, given without any expectation of repayment. God is not a quid pro quo, tit for tat, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of God. He's a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God that is just not like us. So what does this mean for David and for us? Does God's guarantee mean that now, listen, David can do it any way he wants to. He's got this in his back pocket. Hey, yeah, you said forever. I'm gonna, uh, you better, you're going to follow through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my thing. If we can't do anything to get God's blessing, does that mean there's nothing we can do to lose God's blessing? Well, let's listen to what God says in verse 12. It's 
Speaking of David, God says, When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. This will be, as we'll see, Solomon. That will be his son Solomon who does this. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. So God promises David that one of his sons, Solomon, is going to succeed him, and that he will be the one to build the temple. And that God will establish his kingdom, his throne, not just for a generation or two, not just for a few centuries, not for a millennia, but forever. Forever. For the rest of eternity, David's throne and kingdom will be established. But, but notice the end. But if any of them does wrong, God says he will punish them. And if you were to thumb through the rest of 2 Samuel, the first king, 2 Kings, you're going to find out that David's descendants do some horrible things. They are terrible kings for the most part. In fact, they are quick to throw off the God completely and start following the false gods of the people around them. They, um, they accept bribery. They're completely unjust. Um, a few of the kings even offer ch uh, child sacrifices, their own Israelite children as sacrifices to these foreign gods. Some reprehensible stuff is about to happen. And God's not going to let them drag his, mud, his name through the mud. So he's going to bring in the great nation of Assyria to punish the people of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's going to bring in the nation of Babylon a little bit later to invade the southern kingdom of Judah and take away many of his people into exile as a consequence for generation after generation after generation of sin and turning their back completely on God. And yet, we're going to find out God will remain faithful to his promise. He promised that David's throne and kingdom would never end, that his love would never leave them. And why is that? Because they're so great, they're not. Because David's so great, newsflash, we're about to see in the next rest of the book of 2 Samuel, he's going to do some pretty awful things. No, God is faithful to himself. God is faithful to his own promises. If God says he's going to do it, he will do it, no matter what. He won't even let sin change the good purposes he has for his people. And because God knows, ultimately, that human kings are all going to fail and mess up, God will fulfill his promise to David, ultimately, by having his own son, Jesus Christ, become a man, be born in the line of David, and will one day take the throne of his ancestral father David. He is the true and ultimate king that all the kings in David's line point to, but could never really fulfill this promise. Now again, part of God's love to his people is disciplining them. He loves them too much to let them continue on living in a way that is destructive to themselves and destructive to others. He's not going to put up with that. And, and, of course, it's no different for the people that we love. If we see someone continuing in some sort of destructive uh, behavior and patterns, if you truly love them, you're going to go confront them. You're not going to put up for it for their sake. You know, it's the people who just show their shoulders and say, you know, oh, that's their life, they do what they want. It's up to them. However they want to live, that's up to them. Those aren't the people that truly love them. If they love them, they're going to confront them. Not out of hate, not out of indifference, but they confront them out of love for that person. And this is true of God. This is true in the Old Testament for God with his people. Proverbs 3, oops, somewhere I missed something. There we go. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, we read this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son, he delights in. And we see this truth continue into the New Testament in Hebrews 12, where we read this. It says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, oh, hold on, I'm messing up here. All right, let's try this. Okay. Moreover, 
we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines <coughs> us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. Now, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And what these verses are telling us is that we ought to be thankful to God that in his love and in his mercy towards us, he sometimes disciplines us. Because his discipline is never out of anger, it's never out of wrath, never out of unmet expectations, never out of disappointment. Rather, God's discipline flows from his love toward us. Because we are in Christ. Therefore, there's no longer any condemnation. There's no longer any disappointment from God towards us. There's no longer any wrath and anger. Jesus has taken all of that for us. That's why we know that if any discipline hardship comes our way, it's never because God's angry or mad. It's because God loves us and he wants us to live better. He wants us to grow in him. He wants us to be more who he desires and create us to be. If you're experiencing some sort of hardship today, there's a chance that it could be God's merciful discipline. Now, it might not be. Not all hardship is because God's disciplining us. Sometimes hardships come because we live in a fallen world, or we experience hardship because of other people's sin. But here we read that potentially it could be. Hardship sometimes, you know, call us back to God. It's God trying to wake us up from sin and cause it to turn back to Him. Let me illustrate that with this closing illustration. A boy's toy boat, I had to practice that several times, a boy's toy boat <laughs> went out of reach on a pond one day. The boy couldn't reach it anymore. It started floating away. And of course, it started to hang. A man, and then things got worse because there was a man at the pond who started throwing rocks at the boat. And the boy was horrified at what the man was doing. It looked like he was sinking, trying to sink the boat. But of course, that's not what happened at all. The man was throwing the rocks past the boat so that the ripples that the rock created would help bring the boat back to shore. Now many times when we stray away from God, it appears that he is throwing rocks at us. He is trying to sink us. But really, he's using the ripples to bring us back home. Discipline is not God's way of saying, I'm through with you, or it's a mark of abandonment. In fact, it's the opposite. It is the loving act of your Heavenly Father to bring you back to him. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our work. He shouts at us in our pain. Everyone knows that there have been times when we just wouldn't listen to God, or pay any attention to what his word was saying, until finally he caused a severe enough discipline to get our attention so that we might listen. Well, as you celebrate Father's Day today, give thanks for your dads, but give thanks for your Heavenly Father as well. Give thanks that you don't have to work or earn God's love and affection. Give thanks that God is not a quid pro quo, tit for tat, scratch, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of God. Give thanks that his mercy and his patience towards you is there and will never leave. Give thanks that he keeps his promise towards you no matter what. And give thanks that he loves you enough to call you back to himself even if he's got to shout a little to get your attention. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as your word says, discipline is never easy. Painful at the time. But we know in the end it produces a righteousness of harvest. A harvest of righteousness, excuse me. And so, Father, even in this time where we are experiencing hardship from your hand, help us to realize it's never because you don't love us anymore. It's never because you're so angry at us, you're going to thump us. It's out of your love for us to call us back to you, to help us start living the lives where we ought to be living, living like Jesus. Father, we thank you that your promise is steadfast and secure. You have promised that David's throne would never end. Not because <coughs> David's people and David's sons are going to be great, they're going to be terrible. 
but because David's going to have one ultimate son in Jesus Christ who will fulfill everything because he is the God-man. He is the one who is able to do all things. Help us to follow him just as he as a son followed you. We pray this in Jesus' name.